Raji and Vanessa. I'm Molly. Uh, I'm from UI Prep, and today I'm going to share some of my favorite design system tips and tricks with you. So let's jump in with a few tips on how to get started with variables, one of the new features announced today. First, how to create new variables fast. Add new variables by using the shortcut Shift and Enter to add each new variable row. Not having to use the drop-down menu is going to uh, make adding each color much faster, especially if you're using multiple token tiers and have a lot of variables to add. Next, organize variables into groups. Once you have some variables added, place them into groups and subgroups, just like you might with styles or components. You can do this by adding a forward slash to the variable name. Or select multiple variables by holding Shift and right click for the option to group your selection and then give it a name. Next, hide collections from your team library. If you're using color variables, you'll likely want to create at least two collections. One for your color palette with every tint and shade available, like all 10 blues. And one for your alias colors, like all the backgrounds used for CTAs which pull from that original color palette. If you only want your team to use alias colors as they design, hide the entire palette collection by making it private with the dot or underscore in its name. This will greatly reduce the number of options available in the color menu, making it easier for your team to find the right one as they're designing. Lastly, switch variables at the page level. Variables make it easy to support multiple modes, like light mode and dark mode. And any layer with variables applied can switch between them. By default, child layers will automatically inherit the mode of their nearest parent. And since switching modes at the layer level, switch at the page level to update all your designs at once. First, return your layers to auto. Then open the Change Variable Mode menu at the top of the right-hand panel and make a selection. This makes it easy to have just one set of designs for multiple modes. Simply toggle between them to design, compare, and test both. Now I'll jump into a few tips that will take your components to the next level. First, nest properties with an arrow emoji. Give conditional properties the appearance of being nested by placing them next to each other and using an arrow emoji. For example, a button icon might have two properties applied to it. A Boolean property to toggle the visibility on and off. And an instant swap property to change the icon. Naturally, the instant swap property only shows when the icon is visible, so it should appear nested underneath the Boolean property. You can do this by dragging the instance swap property below the Boolean property with the handles that appear on hover, then editing the name to include the arrow emoji. This can be done by pressing Control Command Space on a Mac or Windows and period on Windows. When configuring the button instance, the relationship between the two properties will be much clearer and easier to use. Next, think outside the box with absolute position. Use absolute position to turn any object into an auto layout rule breaker, allowing them to be placed anywhere, even past the bounds of a frame. For example, position a focus ring around your button, allowing it to show any background in the gap and stay the same size no matter the state. To do this, turn clip contents off, place a rectangle stroke inside the auto layout button frame. You can drag and drop or cut and paste. Then apply absolute position to the ring and move it to the desired location while holding the space bar so it remains nested inside the button. Then set the constraints to left, right, top, bottom so the ring expands and shrinks with your button. As text is added and removed, the ring will adjust. This is also very helpful for other components like tooltips and their pointers or cards and their close icons. Next, use frames for almost everything, even circles. 
create circle components with as few layers as possible by making the frame itself round. This is great for components like avatars and notifications. Simply take a styled square, frown, square frame and round all the corners to a high number so it remains a circle at any size. You're left with lightweight, flexible components that'll be nest that can be nested inside of each other. And last but not least, create dynamic text with auto layout wrap and max width. Two new features just announced today. For example, a chat bubble that can grow horizontally and vertically. To do this, apply auto layout to your component and set the direction to wrap. Then apply max width to the text layer using the new max width dropdown and input that will appear. If you run into any trouble, make sure the height and width for both layers are set to hug so it can grow with your text. That's a wrap. Those are some of my favorite design system tips and tricks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Yay! <laughs> Go Molly! Blew my mind every day. OK, Molly already sharing tips from features that launched today. What Some the kind fuck? of time traveler? What? OK, um, all right, I'm going to need you to do one more applause for all the pros in the back. Can we do that now? Just to get them hyped, get them hyped. Remember. Remember, the louder the applause, magically the tips get better. Roger, so no, it's that's really not how it works. You. Roger, don't talk. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Anyways, next up is Eugene, who works at Active Campaign, but also he's the brains and bronze behind Figmalion, our favorite Figma newsletter. And if you haven't liked and subscribed yet, this is your time to open your phone and do that right now. Figmalion, at Figmalion. <laughs> Eugene, more like you genius. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Eugene's going to be presenting on the R's, the G's, and the B's. That's right, colors. Come on up, Eugene. <laughs> Thank you, Raji and Vanessa. Hello, everyone. My name is Eugene, and we will talk about working with colors. Let's start with the basics. Press the I key to open the eyedropper. If you have nothing selected, you can simply preview the color values. If you have an object selected, you can click on any color to replace the topmost fill. That's a great time saver, as you don't even need to open the color panel to change the color. If your object has multiple fills, you can select one of them to replace it. If you click and drag, it will live update the fill as you drag along. The color notation in the eyedropper can be changed in any color panel. Here, I switch it from hex to HSL. One problem with using an eyedropper is that your colors will be detached from styles. This can be fixed by selecting objects and replacing colors with styles one by one in the selection colors. That's a slow process, though. Instead, I rely on the Style Organizer plugin that can scan an entire page and replace all unlinked colors with styles. It supports both local styles and external libraries. Here, you can see how it fixed all the detached colors in one click. Now let's talk about creating consistent and accessible color palettes. You can notice that lime and emerald green are visibly lighter than magenta and purple, but not according to HSL. That's because saturation and lightness in HSL are not perceptually uniform. For these colors, the contrast ratio against white background varies from 1.9 to about 6, or over three times. That's a big difference. We will use the OK Color plugin to correct this. It uses the OK HSL color model, which is based on the old HSL, but with lightness close and matching perception. As you can see here, the lightness of our colors varies in OK HSL. So we will fix it at the same level. Some colors get lighter in the process, while others get darker. Now our contrast ratio ranges from 3.3 .3 to about 3.9, or within 17%. The palette is much more visually consistent. This approach is really useful when you're working on color systems. Now let's talk about working with wide gamut colors inside and outside of Figma. First, why use wide gamut colors? Display the three color space is used by all modern Apple uh, hardware and about 25% larger than sRGB. Notice how much further the limit of P3 is. Can especially compare it in bright 
uh, green, yellow, and red colors. You can use these extra colors to make your designs more rich and vivid, but they can be tricky to work with. By default, the uh, desktop Figma app is set to unmanaged, so it uses the color profiles set by your system display settings. Figma in a browser is always limited to sRGB. We can use this limitation to preview the difference in colors between the two color spaces by opening them side by side uh, in the desktop app and a browser. In this demo, I had to simulate the color difference for compatibility with the projector and the streaming, but I encourage you to try it later yourself. While RGB color values are the same in both windows, in different color spaces, they point to different colors. The brightest colors have much further to go in the P3 color space compared to sRGB. That's why colors in the desktop app on the wide gamut displays are more saturated and bright. The problem is that while we design with wide gamut colors, our designs can get implemented with sRGB. Let's see how we can avoid this when working on the web. The standard CSS hex notation is limited to sRGB, so if we just copy and paste values from Figma to a CSS file, we will get the same old dusty colors as in a browser. Instead, we will use one of the new CSS color notations that support wide gamut screens, color display P3. The three numbers represent red, green, and blue components, so it's very similar to the old way, but operating within P3 color space. To convert 8-bit numbers to floating point numbers, we need to divide each value by 255. If you hate math, you can also use uh, the stop Figma. You can also use built-in calculator in a color sync utility app that comes pre-installed on every Mac. Now we are all set to use the colors in CSS. Here I created a color sample using sRGB colors copied directly from Figma on the top and P3 notation on the bottom. The sRGB colors look washed out in comparison to the P3. Keep in mind this will only work when you work with the brightest colors that are outside of the sRGB color space. Cool, we've got the right colors in CSS, but what if we need to export an image with wide gamut colors? I made an example using the same green and blue colors as before. We will export them as regular PNGs from Figma, which are limited to sRGB. And then we will export them again using Expert PNG with Color Profile plugin. As you can tell from the name, it embeds the correct color profile to the exported file. Let's add these icons to our code sample to see how they look together. The top row has sRGB background with display P3 colors. Uh, with display P3 icons exported by the plugin, while the bottom row has display P3 backgrounds created using the new CSS color notation and sRGB icons exported directly from Figma. The actual color values for greens and blues were the same. The only difference is in color spaces and profiles. To make all these rich colors look even better, let's look at the gradients. Gradients that are going through the center of the color wheel can be muddy and desaturated in the middle. Luckily, this can be fixed by gradient interpolation through color spaces other than RGB. Chromatic Figma is a great plugin that can quickly do this. In my experience, lab color space usually produces the best results. That's it for me. Thank you. Back to you, Roger and Vanessa. It's OK. okay. Woo. I feel like I just see in color now. Get it? Man, I can't do a dad joke. I'm not a dad yet. No. <laughs> Next up is Helena, <laughs> whose name is like the city, but she's from Colorado. Tell us about her. Yeah, Helen is the design <laughs> director at Medium. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's like a little, little blogging publication. Just um, a little one. Yeah, Helena loves those Bezier curves and is one of the creators of the Phosphor icon set. You may have seen it. So we cannot wait for you to see what kind of tips she's going to drop. Yes, she's going to teach us how to draw a heart, which seems easy, right? Now, just you wait. She got some hot vector tips, some nectar to your vector. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get fired. <laughs> OK, Helena, come on up. We heart you. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about one of my longtime passions, icon design. <laughs> Icons are a critical part of our day to day. They help us find our way around. They warn us of things up ahead. 
They help us take actions, and they show a status, like if we're muted or not on a Zoom call. <laughs> Today, we're going to draw a heart icon. And along the way, you're going to learn a ton of vector tips for drawing in Figma. If you're following along, turn on your pixel grid. That's going to give you guidelines to draw against. I'll do that with you now. Snap to pixel grid. That's going to give you, it's going to make it easy for you to draw clean shapes that align and none of this subpixel business. And set your nudge amount to 0.5 or 0.25. That'll give you more granular control as you move around the canvas. OK, let's jump in. The first technique is constructing from shapes. Break your icon down into its component shapes. So for a heart, that might be two circles and a triangular base. Let's draw that out. I'm going to use my circle tool, O. I'll draw two circles side by side. Then I'll use my pen tool, draw my triangular base. Shift X is going to swap the fill and stroke. That's going to be something I use a lot throughout this demo. And then I need to take these lines down. So let me command or control drag. We'll bring those out. And then all I have to do is adjust my handles until I'm happy with my shape. Now, you'll, you'll notice that Figma also snaps the, the handles here to the grid, which is super handy. OK, riffing off that, we can also break a heart down to these arc shapes on the bottom. So I'll do my two circles again. Let's overlap them and see what that looks like. And then I will use my pen tool to draw this Left-hand side arc first, shift X, swap fill and stroke. Now, if I click once, I'm going to get a straight line. If I click and drag, I'll get my curve. OK, that's my first heart. If I want to get a little more creative, I can also use the arc tool to get my arc. So if you hover over a circle, you'll get this little nub. Drag that around. And then I'm going to duplicate that. Let's make the left-hand side. Uh, Command-E will flatten that out for me. And now all I have to do is move that around, resize, until I'm happy with my shape. Great, a, a rounder heart. Um, so we built up a heart from, from circles. And you can also think of shapes subtractively. So if you subtract one circle from another, that's a moon. If you build up a bunch of circles, that can create more complex icons as well, like a brain. Technique two is mirroring. Consider if there's any symmetry in your icon. For a heart, there's a horizontal symmetry between the left and right sides. So let's take that insight, and we're going to draw with our pen tool, let's draw the left side first. I'm going to do an angular one just for fun. And then if I copy that over, what I can do is Shift H. That's going to flip it horizontally. And Shift V flips it vertically. I'm going to link these up by Command E. If you would like, you can also come in here and round out the tops. <laughs> Thank you. There's another symmetry here uh, between these two pieces. Let's see what we can do with that. So if we use our rectangle tool, we can draw this, tilt it on its side, or we can continue with our pen tool. And let's do, yeah, let's draw out this, this side first. Shift X again, and then round that out. I'm going to follow the same logic, copy that over, Shift H, nudge it into place. If you're feeling more ambitious, you can go ahead and do it all in one go. Let's see if I can do that here. Um, so Figma gives me these red guidelines. That's super helpful. And then I can come in and round off my tops again. Here's a cool trick. If I convert this to a component and duplicate that over, I can, or duplicate an instance of that over, 
When I manipulate the original, you'll see I can get a live preview of the heart I'm drawing. That's pretty cool. Uh, if I want to flatten that out, since they are components now, I can Union and Command E. Paying attention to symmetry is super helpful when you're drawing things like gears, atoms, and command keys. Great. Our third technique is freehand. What if I wanted a more organic heart? Then I will take my pencil tool, Shift P, and I'm going to draw a few hearts here. With this technique, you might, it might take you a few tries to get one you like. And what I can do is, OK, I'm liking this, but I don't really like this. This curve is a little bumpy. So I'm going to select these nodes. Shift Delete is going to smooth that out for me. Let's try that again over here. And how about down here? That's looking much better. I can also close the gaps on these hearts. If I simply move over a node over top of this one, Figma is going to be really thoughtful and connect that for me. Or I can come in and Command J for a straight connection. Command Shift J is going to give me a smooth connection or a curved connection. What if I wanted a broken heart? Oh, then I'm going to come in here. I'm going to do a little zigzag. And the cool thing about this is that if I move this node around, it's going to stay connected. And that's what we call vector networks in Figma. OK, I got one more thing for you. This is my favorite. Um, if I use my pen tool, and I'm going to draw a simple V, I'm going to round out the end caps. And then all I have to do is nudge up my stroke thickness until I start to see my heart. <laughs> and this is still a stroke, so if I wanted to outline that out, I can Shift-Command-O. That's triggering something else. So <laughs> when in doubt, you can always use your Quick Actions menu. Uh, so Command-Slash. Uh, we'll bring that up, and I will say Outline Stroke. There we go. Awesome. These are all the shortcuts we learned today. Take a screenshot, take a photo, save it for later. Thank you so much. Happy drawing. Good job. OK, uh, shout out to the Figma security team for decking me out with that shortcut, opening Okta. You know, got to get my apps on deck. Um, we've learned so many things so far. How are we all feeling? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I got you, boo. Uh, I'm an I'm a, I'm a IT expert, too. Did you know? Wait, hold on. This is what happens when you do live demoing on stage. Oh. So I just want to give all the props to Helen for actually having the daring uh, ability to come up here and live demo. You know all the things that can go She's wrong. Killing it. And uh, yeah, Vanessa's trying to get her. Oh my gosh. Back. <laughs> it's okay. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> that was a that was a quick tip for you all. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. So many different ways to make a heart and incredible vector tips along the way. I think we can agree with that. Who's next, Ves Vanessa? V Ves Ves what? Vespa. Yeah. Ve mm -hmm. Go. It's Resmir. Um, he's our lead for Friends of Figma Bosnia. And we have these Friends of Figma groups all over the world. So check out the one near your city. Um, we're so excited to have him. Yeah, when we asked Russ Mir to come here, he said that this was the second best news of his life after becoming a dad. And to which I responded, like, why isn't it the first best? It should be the first. Like, why isn't it be the honest. first best come news? Come on, guy. Um, Russ Mir is going to be talking to us about tips and tricks for everyday use. Come on up, Russ Mir. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Rismir. So, thank you for the lovely introduction, Vanessa and Raji. Let's talk about uh, tips and tricks for everyday use. Mm. So, we often rely on the Figma Mirror app or prototype during our working day as a reference for our design. But the new Figma, uh, the new Figma preview feature launched today definitely allow us to always have 
preview enable so we can track every change during the prototypes or changes uh, on our screens. In access uh, the new feature preview, you can go and hit shift space or you can go in the upper right corner and choose between presenting and preview mode. Um, creating a brand system for marketing design uh, for marketing department enables us definitely to adapt our designs uh, to any kind of social media in a second. And we can adjust that design really accordingly and, and really at speed. The one of the benefits is if the layer naming and the component properties are set uh, correctly, designing becomes definitely easy for us. So we can just track from assets library the instances from different kind of companies, uh, components and just swap them. In order to access the library, we can use the shortcut option two or L2 on the windows and to drag and replace the instances from the library, use the command option and drag. Uh, Nudge, we all know how we use the Nudge, but most of us use the Nudge feature in our daily work, either to moving or aligning items on our artboard. But there's also, so we have a glitch, I think. Yeah, we have a glitch. Let me just go back. It's working. Yeah. That's config. I mean, most of the use nudges, as I say, we use it by moving or changing the positioning. But there's also an uh, opportunity to use the nudge feature in order to change our corner radius, uh, paddings, typography sizes all kind of margins, uh, but also we can do different things. And of course, in, to access our nudge feature, so just shift command uh, forward slash type, ni type nudge uh, and change your values either 1, 4, or 4, 8, depending on what kind of grid uh, sizes you're working. Uh, Significant portion of my work, uh, my daily work, relies on writing documentation besides the presenting, writing documentation for the design system, and it can be also uh, time consuming. And again, we have a glitch, but it doesn't matter. I will talk on and on. Uh, definitely uh, to access our plugins, so you can go to the resource tab or use the shortcut letter Shift I to access the, uh, the, the plugin list, and this is the list of the plugins that I'm using. And I often rely on several plugins like Style Organizer, Super Palette, PropStar, Auto Documentation, HShape Specs, and of course, Regressor. And I think my fellow colleague, Christina, will talk a little bit more about HShape Specs on her talk. Uh, props multi-select layer, one of the beautiful things. Uh, this option definitely simplifies selecting um, and setting multiple component layer properties and styles with just one click. So imagine you have a several different variants. You make a component out, uh, choose uh, whatever kind of part do you want. So in this case, I use just a label. And selecting um, multi-select layers properties, I can set the Boolean property. The next one is basically that I can change the typography style. I can change the color style, and I can also change the layer content uh, in, in, in our properties. So we still stick to the component naming properties. Uh, since we are talk, the whole kind of config team is about developers and designers collaboration. While we often rely on functional or action-oriented uh, naming logic, we should definitely em emphasize with developers and consider how they use uh, the naming conventions in the code. And definitely by creating the components um, and their properties in the design system, we shall align as closely as possible with, a, with the naming convention that our developers are using. And of course, don't forget, these are the same names appearing in our exported code, so be sure to ask and to closely collaborate with our developers and ask them the, what are their preferred names, uh, naming conventions uh, for, the, for the components and for the code itself. One more for the components. Um, when it comes to the component props in fast speed production, we often rely on a, on a default native uh, components that we set. In this case, I showed two button components. Uh, often when we build a button component, we use like a lead icon, label, trailing icon, and other properties. But most uh, native uh, component usage by the buttons is uh, having the primary button only with a CTA. So I hope this helps you, definitely. Uh, branching is something that we 
had introduced last year. Imagine this. In my company, we used uh, to juggle a file with different pages. And that was our old approach last year. But guess what? Uh, after several brainstorming sessions, we have tried to find out the new design delivery. And we wanted to get rid from, four, uh, from one page with, uh, from one file with different pages, like in review, archive, done for dev, and leverage branching for our needs. And our flow was basically that uh, PO writes a Jira ticket for our designers, asking them to change something. Designers go to the master file, uh, create a branch, following the naming conventions, like uh, the purpose of the branch, in this case is work in progress, using the Jira ticket number and adding the title of the, of the ticket and also initials so we can track always which designers change something or worked on the branch. And the next process um, was basically when the designer is done with, it, with changing everything and is ready to go to show to the product owner. He basically comment on the Jira ticket, providing the, the, branching, the branching link, changing the purpose of a, of a branch name from work in progress to in review, and notify the product owner everything is set up for the review. And after that, the, the, the third step was basically uh, the product owner goes, approves everything, change the pur purpose of the branch from in review to done for developers, create a new ticket for our developers, and just providing them the branch link. So the chain in command is basically always using the same kind of branch link. And of course, the last step is when we have shipped our stuff in a, in a production, product owners create for the last time the one ticket that says, OK, please uh, merge everything to the master file and review and, master, and, and merge to the master file. So, that, that's something that helped us uh, to maintain only one master file. And basically, here's the exciting part. We harness the magic of single source of true, one single master file. And that's basically one master file for every feature in our products that we're using. So there's no cluttering pages and cluttering design everywhere. And of course, most important, we say goodbye to the days of confusion and versioning chaos between us. And of course, last but not least, uh, the private color style. So everybody knows that we can uh, hide specific uh, base components in our component library that we don't want to show up in, the, in our design system or library, published library. But uh, do you know that you also can do the colors and typography? You can hide them. And I will skip again. <laughs> that happens. That's live. Oh, sorry. I can go back again. Hopefully it works. Yeah, so basically using the same, same kind of approach for the components on the typography and the color styles, you can use either underscore or the dash. And by publishing the library, they will not appear later on a file where they are used. Uh, we often use uh, this kind of approach for our internally designed system, commenting on different components. And of course, I will not say that we're using Comic Sans, but yes, we use Comic Sans as a GAF. So, I think that's it uh, from my side. I will say thank you for listening and thank you for being here. Back to Vanessa and Raji. Okay. The baby that's a good one. That's improvisation. <laughs> Okay. Resmere, take a little bit of a brain break here. Figured there's probably so much knowledge pouring in. Jesus. And uh, I mean, before the next session, <laughs> we're going to give your brains a little break. Uh, what do you think about all this swag, y'all? Not bad, huh? The tote bags, the water. Come on, I want to hear it. We spent a, we, we got all of the swag from you. We're so excited. Um, a cool thing about my job here is that I have access to all the swag. Um, why don't we give some away? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, so if, o if only we had like a t-shirt cannon, like, uh, okay, okay they, they love it, but Claire and Ozra, who are in charge of us, actually said no, but I, I kind of have an idea. Yes. Um, um, Jay, can you come up here real quick? <laughs> well, we have this t-shirt slingshot. It's not a cannon, but it's good enough. We're going to throw some things at you. Uh, we are not liable for any damages incurred, but we are liable for the fun. <laughs> so, we're also uh, liable for dripping you out. For dripping you out with some swag. Um, we're going to do this. <laughs> we, ex we expense these because, you know, all right. Okay. 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 <laughs> 
I be going to? My job is really fun. I mean, you need to ask where you want it to go. All right, all right, all right. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> ah, oh. I hate this so much. Let's talk it. Just, just yeah. One more, try, one, one more try, one more try, one more try. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. Shall we eat? <laughs> one over the center. I can't do this. All right, I'm going over here. All right, you ready? You ready? <laughs> okay, should have played football. Should have played football. Uh, should, oh, kick it, kick it, kick it. <laughs> no, I can't do it. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry to the cameras. <laughs> Anyways, um, don't buy this on Amazon. It's not worth it. Zero, zero stars. <laughs> we, we have a lot of fun at this company, I think. Um, next slide, please. No, it. No, oh, you got it? it? Oh, God. All right. Oh, God. Um, wait, 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 wait. All right. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to put on our serious hats now. Thanks for entertaining that. What a dream for us. All right. Our next up is Christine. Christine teaches Figma at moonlearning.io. And Christine is obsessed with Mexican clamatoes. If you have a Mexican clamato, <laughs> bring one. I don't, what is that? What is it? A clam? Does anyone know what a Mexican clamato? Clamato? Tam clamato? Clam tomato? I don't know. Anyway, Christine's here from Madrid. Uh, it's my favorite city in the world, actually. And she's going to present on tips for collaborating and sharing. Come on up, Christine. <laughs> Hello. Oh, wow. There's a few of you. Just Roger and Vanessa's closest friends today, right? <laughs> yeah, I like keeping it intimate around here. So hi, I'm Christine, and I run an online learning platform called Moon Learning, where I talk and teach about UX, UI, and primarily Figma, which I guess is why I'm here today. And I especially love this magic area where design meets code. So I brought you a few tips and tricks today um, around sharing, collaborating, and documenting in Figma. So my first advice would be, always store your components on sections. If you don't know about sections, then you'll find them in your top tool, um, top toolbar, right under frames. And you can also use the shortcut Shift and S. And then you just draw sections on your canvas as you would with frames. And as you saw, they became so much more relevant today. Now, whoops, I have to go back. This is good that it's a small family event, so we can do these little things here and just walk over and do that. Great. So um, one thing I like about sections is that um, actually all the information around your component keeps on showing up. So you have the little symbol signs and everything. Now, this seems really minor, but if someone enters your file that doesn't know it, who's its way around a the file, then it's actually really great, and they don't need to jump through the layers panel. Another thing is you can add more information to your section. So you can add frames with additional information. So here, for example, I'm pulling over an instance. Then I can open the new in file preview, which we all love, which is shift and space, the shortcut. And so you can see the interactive behavior of your component right there. Now, just as with um, frames before, if you add your component, if you add your components to your sections, then that's going to create a folder in your assets panel, keeping everything nicely organized. And you can not only use sections for your components, but also for your overall design setup to organize everything. And today, my favorite feature that was launched: if you click on the name of that section, this should be. Yeah, here we go. You see this little symbol appear. Now you can mark your sections as ready for development. So if we then jump over to our new dev mode, and the shortcut for this is Shift and D, then you can see that now we have a designated area where we have all our designs and components that can move on to the next step. So really, really handy. Now, sections are not only useful when it comes to um, organizing and documenting, they're also great when it comes to prototyping because they make your design stateful. That means that if you connect to a section, and Figma is going to remember the frame in that section that you last visited. If you jump back into the section from any other given place, then it's going to go back to where you left off. And this is incredibly helpful when we're building things like sign-ups and checkouts. 
So in short, sections are perfect for grouping, contextualizing, and simply organizing your design system. But what if you already set up all this great documentation and information on frames? Don't worry. You can simply right-click any frame, and then you can convert it into a section. You could also use the preset drop-down for frames. And here, you can actually convert between frames, sections, and even groups, and obviously, um, all the way around that you want to. Now, setting up specs and documentation, however big or small that is now after the launch today, is a very time-consuming process. And I want to show you one of my favorite plugins, which is the 8Shape Specs plugin. Very long name, very quick name to document, a uh, very quick way to document. All you need to do is you drag out an instance, you click on that instance, run the plugin, and then with one click, this is going to create those amazing specs for you. Now, what I especially like is these specs are set up in little frames. So what we can do is we can pull over just the information that we want to, and we can add it to our section that we just set up with our component. And so we have everything in one place ready to mark for development the way that we want it to be. Now, if we're working, collaborating, then a lot of the time there are changes, and these changes might be very small. And this is where I love using the overlay comparison feature. So if you're getting, in your design mode, an update request for components, instead of just updating the entire file, what you can do is click on an instance, and then next to the instance name, you see this little circle appear. Now, with this circle, you can click to update available and then review the updates. And what you're going to get is a side-by-side -side comparison of your old component and your new component. And you can switch that over to overlay, and you can get the old and the new one on top of each other. Now, so far, we only had this in design mode. Today, as you saw, we also have this feature in our new dev mode. So it's the same thing. We go and have a look at the changes in our design. We now first get the side-by-side -side comparison with all the additional information. And now here as well, we can switch this over to overlay. In this case, this is entire pages of our design. Now, in those last five minutes, I've already been jumping back and forth in all our panels, and there are great shortcuts for this. Now, Alt-1 is the layer panel, Alt-2 is assets, Alt-8 design panel, and Alt-9 prototyping. I had to read that off my screen here, and you probably already forgot all of that while looking at this screen. But if you think of them in this way, then actually the place where they're positioned on your keyboard is the same place they're positioned in your Figma user interface, and you're surely not going to forget about them again. Um, I set up a little playground file for you in my community section. Visit figma.com forward slash at moon learning, and then you can try out all of this yourself. And also, make sure to follow me on um, moon learning, Twitter, LinkedIn, and visit moonlearning.io. And thank you so much for your attention. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. There are these stairs that we have to get up to. And this is like my fifth time doing it. I'm so tired. <laughs> OK, I feel like I'm a documenting pro now. And I don't know if I've ever seen anyone use sections so well. We also had a lot of commentary on Christine's voice. So, so, so calming. I want it on a recording. Headspace by config. Hello. <laughs> I mean, also, another flex again. Christine's teaching us about features that were just launched today. My Dylan, I'm sorry. Apparently, she already knew, or maybe she made them. I'm we're, not sure. We're uh, trying to work on our privacy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Well, I'm excited to bring up my longtime friend, Joey Banks, up next. Oh, my gosh. Joey, he's an OG figmate from back in the day. Um, he's now a pro senior product designer at Webflow, and he's all around just a great guy. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure you all know, you probably never, yes, of course you've heard of Joey Banks. He builds some awesome files for the Figma community and has done so for us for years. So, Joey's here to present on a few things that he wishes he knew, and I'm hoping that it'll be about Figma stuff. I hope so, I too. Hope so. <laughs> yeah. Come on up, Joey. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Joey. It is so awesome to be here and to meet so many of you. Um, thanks for coming. 
this is all about the things I wish I knew. I love teaching about I love teaching others about Figma, and I can't wait to get into it. Uh, I know how to use the clicker. All right, uh, let's talk about this first one. This is for everyone out there, like myself, who loves keyboard shortcuts. Did you know that in, in Figma, there's a drawer that can sit at the bottom here, and it shows all of the keyboard shortcuts that are available within this amazing tool. It even shows what shortcuts you have yet to discover and which ones you've already used. When I was learning Figma, I had this pinned at the bottom to help me really level up everything that I wanted to learn and all of the different features that were available. Now, you may know about version history, but what you might not know is that for all of your previous versions, you can choose to right click and actually go into version history and right click a, uh, and to choose to copy a link to your previous version to share out with others on your team. I use this all the time because I don't know about you, but my files get so bloated with so many different pages and different files and all of that. And so I like keeping my archive simple and to just really just copy a link and share that out for others to use. Now, I wish there were a plugin out there that showed how many miles my cursor had traveled between the canvas and the top right to choose the different alignment tools within Figma. It would be in the thousands, because I didn't know the shortcut for these. And so there's a shortcut which allows you to click on an object, and then using Option or Alt, just use the W, A, S, or D keys to change the alignment of the object. You can also use Option or Alt and V and H to align vertically or horizontally. And I think the coolest part about this tip is uh, you might notice that as I'm changing the alignment, the constraints are also changing with the alignment that's set. I never knew that, and I thought that was so cool. All right, now, also, if you're like me, you might enjoy trying to build the most complex components possible within Figma using auto layout. And a component that I tried to create and I wanted to share with you here today was a slider. And this slider uses auto layout but I'm able to adjust the position of the slider without breaking the instance or without detaching the instance. How this is done is I have the tiniest little pixel at the start, and I'm simply just changing the value between that pixel and the knob, and it's changing the value right there on the canvas. Happy to help you recreate this. This, I thought, was so cool, and I just wanted to share it today. All right, now this one continues to blow my mind. If you have a design and it's something like this, and if I drag it off the canvas and if I resize it, it totally breaks. How many times has this happened? Well, there's a shortcut that allows you to use the layout grid here. And by simply applying a very uh, simple two-column layout grid here, you'll notice right away, as soon as I apply this, my design is fixed. And this is because constraints are able to use layout grids to come together. Again, this one still blows my mind, and I really wish I would have known this one sooner because it would have saved me a lot of time. All right, now for this one, uh, so, many t so much time spent linking up different elements within a prototype, especially around a tab bar. When we're creating prototypes, we're often relinking things multiple times to really fit into the different screens. And with this one here, I was, I was choosing to link up the tabs multiple times to go to, to create those different connections. And what I want to share is that you can create a new local component out of either an instance or any object, link these uh, different connections up just once, and then using command to or sorry, uh, paste to replace, we can take that local instance, paste it right on top, and immediately all of our connections carry through the design. If I had known this sooner, this definitely would have saved me time. All right, how many people here love using auto layout? I know I do. Awesome. These next tips are all about auto layout. So the first one that I want to share is that you can hold modifier keys while dragging handles to change padding uniformly on all sides. As I'm holding Option or Alt plus the Shift key, I can change the padding all the way around this container here. In this case, I'm going to set it to an even 32, which makes me happy. Similar tip, you can actually click on an object that uses auto layout. Use Command or Control and click directly in the field, and you can change that value all the way around at once. So we're setting the top, left, bottom, and right padding values immediately just by command clicking and entering a number. No more pressing tab all the time. This, one, this tip here I truly did not know, and this is the ability to click on an edge holding modifier keys to change the resizing value for an object. In this case, I'm clicking on the right, and I'm holding the Shift key, and I'm setting the resizing property to Hug. 
But if I choose to click and I hold the Option or the Alt key, I can change the resizing property to fill. I seriously did not know this, and as my good friend Eugene says, this would have saved me a lot of time in my mouse commute from the canvas to the top right controls. A little while ago, Figma announced base, uh, aligning items to baseline within an auto layout container. And I was always wondering if there was a shortcut for this, and it turns out there is. If you have an object selected that uses auto layout, you can click right inside the grid and just press B on the keyboard, which immediately aligns all of those objects to the baseline. Now for this next one, uh, this is the ability to choose to use modifier keys to change the direction or to adjust the alignment of an object that's using auto layout. So here, I've got a shape inside, and I've clicked on the auto layout container. If I click inside of the auto layout grid, I can press W, A, S, or D, or even the arrow keys, or V and H, to change the alignment of this object. Before, I was always tapping on the container, going to the alignment grid, going back, going back, and so this has saved me a ton of time in my work. All right, now for this final tip here, this is all about on-canvas controls. And in Figma, you can hover over the object, change the padding directly on the canvas. We can set padding all the way around here, and we can even choose to drill in and to use the gap value to change the space between for something like this. The tip I want to share, too, is that if you hold Shift, you can adjust the value um, based on your big nudge setting. This is so helpful and something I use all the time. So that's all I've got for you. It's so good to see you again. Thank you for being here, and I appreciate it. I'll see you soon. Great job, Joey. Whoa. He's the auto layout math god. Oh, so many shortcuts. I'm going to use that today. <laughs> so up next is Femme. So Femka is the design lead at Gusto, where she leads design with Gusto. I think she wrote that joke. OK. We wrote it. We wrote it. <laughs> Fun fact, Femka was in a stage musical production of Annie as an 11-year-old in her hometown of Wellington, New Zealand. It's a hard knock life for us. It's not. Tech okay. is so chill. <laughs> Anyway, um, she's going to demonstrate how to collaborate at speed. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Come on up, Femka. Woo! Woo. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here. My name is Femka. I'm a design lead at Gusto and also an educator at Femka.design. We're going to talk all about collaborating at speed. Let's start with design crit. I like to kick off my design crits by having a context gathering template to get everyone in the room on the same page. You can do this by creating a section in FigJam and have, to have different areas in this section around things like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? What are the goals of your project? You might also want to include a visualization of your design process and indicate where in that process you're at. Then you might include some space for the kind of feedback you're looking for and the kind of feedback you're not looking for. This is really helpful for folks in Crit to understand how they can give feedback that will help you move forward in your project. Once we're all on the same page, I then like to walk through the work that I would like the feedback on, and then encourage feedback through silent feedback time. One way I like to do this is by using stickies in FigJam. So I often will create a section, then I'll add some of the stickies. And a pro tip here is to color code your stickies to represent different themes. Maybe you have different themes for the kind of feedback you'd like. So for example, you might have green to represent kudos, blue for suggestions, and red for questions. This is really helpful for folks who are giving you feedback to think about how they might frame their feedback in a way that is really helpful for you. Then set a timer using FigJam's built-in timer, set some vibes, some music, and then people can easily add stickies as their feedback. Really helpful for you after crit to then use the color coding to cluster the feedback into different themes. All right, how many times have you or your team created principles only for them to get stale in a Google Doc or presentation? At Gusto, we bring our principles to life through component stickies. You can easily create component stickies and then drag and drop them into your file in different places to bring the principles to life. For example, you might drag in a principle to a certain part in your flow to add as rationale for the design decision you're making, 
or just to evangelize the principles and use it as a reminder for the work and thinking that went into a particular design decision. Now, Augusto, we're super lucky to have a brand design team to create these beautiful illustrations for us, but they don't need to be so elaborate. You could use emojis, create some sort of visual flourish, or maybe there's something in the Figma community you could use to help evangelize and bring your principles to life. All right, face stamps. This is really helpful if you're collaborating with other designers in the same Figma file. You might want to add face stamps to add context throughout the file in terms of who has ownership over different parts of that file. I like to do this through components by creating a few different shapes. Uh, you may have seen I had a circle and a square. Then I have a component kind of embedded into that component with different uh, avatars for each of the members on the design team. I also had variants, a black and white version and a color version. Then you can easily drag and drop those face stamps into your file, switch out the avatars to represent the folks that are actually working on that file, and then just place those anywhere in your file for where it makes sense. Like, for example, maybe adding it to your cover thumbnail. All right, fast annotation. So imagine someone coming into your Figma file and they don't know where to start. There are some great Figma community resources and plugins to make this easier, like this plugin by Charlie Marie called Scribbles. Here I'm adding a sticker to indicate where in the file folks should start when they come into my file. Flowkit by MDS is super great for visualizing flows without having to create end-to-end -end prototypes. You can just click two elements, and it will automatically create arrows between the elements you select. You can also drag and drop in a particular arrow, give it a bit more customization. And I love Notes by Sarah. Here you can add different notes to different parts of your file, and you might want to color code those or have different notes for logic or maybe just a note to an engineer. All right, asset handoff. How annoying is it for your devs to have to go and find all the assets in your file and download or export them one by one? Well, you can set this up really easy for them so they can just do it in one click. Create a new page in your Figma file, add all of your exportable assets into that page, name those assets in the Layers panel appropriately, how you would like them to be named after they're exported, then set up your export settings so now all your engineer has to do is come in, go to File, Export, and just with one click, it will export all of those assets, named how you named them, and at the pre-configurated export settings. And lastly, better image download for your engineers. Let's say we have an image that's embedded inside a shape layer. Like, for example, this red car is in this square. Often, engineers will need the original image in its original aspect ratio. So instead of having them dig through the layers to try to find and export that image, they can do this super easily by going to Inspect, then going down to CSS, making sure they're selected on table. Then there's actually a little link there to open the image in the browser. From there, it will open the image in the browser at its full aspect ratio. They can right click, save, and download, and have it there ready to use in code. Happy collaborating. Thank you so much. It's time to say goodbye. I'm not ready. <laughs> OK, everybody, you may have noticed that with Eugene's slides, they were a little out of sync there. We're going to offer a position for Eugene on our virtual hosting tomorrow to be able to do that right. I know we put in so much work for, for you all. Also, Vanessa? We're going to have a happy hour tonight from 5 to 7. We hope to see you there. And if not, see you on the internet. Thanks so much. <laughs>